Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. In today's Britain, white working class men are losing their way. We all work, you know I mean? We're not just scumbags, but people look at us like we're just fucked. Many feel demonised, forgotten, and angry. There's a lot of foreign people living in this town now, and it's, it's just like demoralising. They're thinking, wow. I'm Professor Green. I'm a musician, a documentary maker, and I'm from a working class background. You know, you've already brought three kids up and all of a sudden you're bringing up me. Well, it was either that or having put into care. I grew up on a council estate in Hackney and I had first-hand experience of growing up in a low-income family. All oh, the lock-up time has come to this. <coughs> Over the next six months, I'm going to follow six very different young men, each trying to make something of their life. If you don't pass your GCSEs, you're going to work on a building site for the rest of your life. I've chosen them because I think their stories reveal a crisis at the heart of working class life. If you take rejection after rejection after rejection... Will I go there and, and be looked down upon as a result? Together, they'll show us what life is really like today for working class lads. There's days where I don't want to get out of bed, I don't want to see no one. I want to understand why many of these men feel abandoned and what the consequences are for Britain if we continue to look away. White working class, that's a bit ridiculous. No, it's not. I'm doing a documentary. I haven't come here to call names, so don't tell me what I am. Working class male pride used to be founded on a job, a family, and a community. In this film, I'm meeting three young men who are each struggling to make something of themselves in a world where these things can no longer be taken for granted. I want to start with a stereotype of a lazy working class lad. You all right? How you doing, Stephen? All right, Stephen. Nice it's a Wednesday afternoon, right. and I've come to Bolton to meet 20-year-old David and his mates. What are you up to? Just having a game of football. He needs a smoking display. I was going to make a joint. <laughs> How do you all know each other? Through town, innit? Through right. town. Yeah. We used to get, all get messed up. Everyone just got town. David, what did you do for work? I used to work at the scrapyard. The boss was being a bit of iffy with me, so I ended up leaving it. I was just doing cash and hand work. What's Bolton like for lads your age who are out of work? It's not too good, you know. No smaller employers, they just don't look twice at us because of where we're from and what we've been through in our life. And most of us, what we've been through in our life, it's, it's not, not really our fault. David, in the immediate future, what are your hopes and aspirations? Then hopefully, if we get a job, I'm just going to stick to it. Then hopefully, I find the right person, settle down, have kids, then just try and do my own little life. They're the kids that everyone sees and passes judgment on. You know, oh, they're fucking trouble. A lot of people would probably be quite intimidated by them. Hanging about wherever they're hanging about, being loud, being boisterous, being boys. But there's stories behind them all, aren't there? David is one of over a quarter of a million young men not in education or employment. He spent the last four years in homeless hostels. Where are we off to now? We're off to, uh, it's like a takeaway. It's for like homeless people, you know, who's on the streets and like in hostels. Mm. Do like food for them on certain days. All yeah, right, Steve. How you doing? How you doing, mate? This is Green. Steven. It is. How you doing? Pleased to meet you. Lovely to meet you. He's my so-called son. <laughs> David was introduced to the restaurant run by British Pakistanis by another hostel resident, 51-year-old Steve. 
الان فینا نشه فا Oh, you see hot streets like getting into bother and then well, well what are you doing and then I just try and push in the right direction, you know what I mean? I've been there, seen it, done it. In that situation you're obviously gonna band together, aren't you? You have to. If you're on the streets and you have absolutely nothing at all and you just need something, but then in that relationship, who's really looking after each other? Who needs each other more? That makes me suspicious. Who's here? This is my dad. Because my mum, I've got ashes from them, so we're going to get a little separate slot put behind with ashes in. How old are you when you passed? I was about 15, 16, when I lost my mum and dad. How did they pass, if you don't mind? Uh, my dad died of heart attack and my mum died of cancer. How did you deal with losing your mum and your dad so close? I didn't, I suffered with it bad. Went missing for like a month, didn't come back. How over time have you coped with it? Some days I feel all right and there's days where I don't want to get out of bed, I don't want to see no one. I'm never going to be happy. Because the only time he's happy when he's been with Dad. Well, that bit bad. Thank you. Losing a parent is horrible, but losing both your parents at any age, let alone at 16, what, what do you do? I feel for him, man. You can tell how much, how much his dad meant to him. He's lost everything. And he is vulnerable. He's, he's, he's young, he's impressionable, and he's, he's vulnerable. I left David thinking how difficult it must be for him to even know who he is, let alone find a way forward. But what about those who know exactly where they want to go? University is sold as a way up the social ladder. White working class boys are the least likely to attend. Is this a failure of talent or a fear we don't belong? I've come to the South Coast to meet Lewis, a 17 year old who's embracing education. So tell me about Lewis. Lewis? Yeah. He's my son. He's yeah. 18 on Monday and he's just secured himself a conditional offer at Cambridge. So is Lewis the first person in the family to go to university? Yes. Um, his dad never went to university um, and I obviously never went. Has anyone else in here been to university? No. No? <laughs> university. I'm quite excited to meet Lewis. It's, a, it's amazing. Hello, mate. What's happening? Nice to meet you. How you doing? You all right? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good to meet you. Good. Right. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Had a nice drive up this morning. I'm completely taken aback. I didn't expect you to hold yourself how you do or to, to speak how you do. It's a very different accent to... Yeah, yeah from mum. From mum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone asks me, though, if I had £5 for every time anybody said, is he mine, I'd be quite wealthy. That's good. <laughs> How do you think you, you, you came to speak how you do? I don't know. I suppose just trying to speak properly, really. I don't know. It just, it just happened. Do people pick up on it? Um, yeah, every time, all the time. Um, how I sound posh for my area, yeah. Lewis presents himself unlike any working-class teenager I've ever met. But despite appearances, our backgrounds are similar. Brought up in social housing, qualified for free school meals. But whilst I was kicked out of school, Lewis is fighting back against a culture of low expectations. So is this your desk? Well, yeah, in effect, yeah. I, I find paper quite expensive. I can make head nor tail of that. 
So basically this is a way of making tanx and cotex as polynomials uh, and approximating them in that form. Have you had a lot of help along the way with special tuition? No. In my opinion, people from private schools get a lot of help with that sort of thing. It feels quite uneven. Yeah, unfortunately so. How different will the course of your life be if you do or don't get into the school? So if I, if I do get in, then I feel that it's only going to get better. I don't know anyone from where I grew up that went to Oxford or Cambridge. I don't. And he is an exception. He's making his own path, and I think that takes it's not just ambition, it's courage. In the UK, only 15% of white working class boys get five or more decent GCSEs. Nice to have Lewis back. Yeah. You can tell me the truth. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely <laughs> fantastic to have him back. You know, he was always, uh, well, he had a real aura about him. Meeting Lewis's old librarian revealed more about the difficulties he had faced. Did you ever feel different to um, the other kids? For a few years, yeah. You know, people brand you a nerd or a geek or whatever. He was very shy and he wasn't as as confident as he is now. Mm. Why do you think you were singled out for being smart? Um, well, because not everyone here was necessarily that way inclined. So you... It was the same at my school. Mm. I remember, you know, people got picked on for being intelligent. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of be normal, per se. But then again, towards the end of school, towards exams, you sort of realise, actually, you do need to be intelligent and you do need to work hard for it. Lewis's ability in math sets him apart, but there's a risk in being exceptional. I wonder what anxieties Lewis might face as his dream of Cambridge gets closer. For working class lads, it isn't just education, but business that's been sold as a way out. And in Essex, I'm meeting Denzel, a young entrepreneur who's intent on hustling his way to the top. When I was really in the shit, I didn't have no money. I, I had nothing. I, I went and worked for um, an escort firm. I, I've always wanted to be in the porn business. I do whatever I have to do to earn money. For the middle classes, your job is often an important part of who you are. But the reality of much low-paid work is it offers little beyond the wage. 29-year-old Denzel is an old tank installer with big ambitions. Denzel is part of an entire generation who can no longer expect the same levels of income their parents enjoy. But he's not short of ideas for climbing the ladder. Oh, it's a crazy idea at the time. I bought untold amount of sex toys. I love the sex toy. The best sellers, don't ask why, the best sellers were the big 18-inch double-ended dildos. <laughs> they were the best sellers. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that would be it, mate. Oh, mate, you, yeah. you do crack me up. His wheeling and dealing offers Denzel a chance to reinvent himself. But for now, he lives with his neck. Sorry, right. Sorry I didn't know it was open. Sorry, oh, come, in. come in, Stephen. How old are you, James? Well, I'm 29, nearly 30. Well, that's when I need to sort my life out. That's when I've got to butt my ideas up. So when I'm 30, that's when I'm really going to knuckle down in my 30s. Well, I? I think you're doing well, because before you was here, you didn't nothing. work. I was on the dole when I... You didn't, yeah, you was on the dole. You wouldn't get a job. No way, no how. Literally just sleeping and playing with me plonker every day, yeah. wasn't and it? And I took nothing off of him then, <laughs> did I? <laughs> well, that's why, yeah, I'm always, that's that's right. why I'm always looking at the business opportunities, because a business could turn around and make you a nice profit. Denzel believes he's just one big deal away from realising his ambitions. Yeah, this is my pad anyway. It's not much in here. But in striving to make a name for himself, I wonder whether he's lost something more important. That's my little girl there. Oh, mate, she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous, isn't she? She's my world, really, but I ruined it for myself. So how did it, how did it all go wrong? I enjoyed the buzz from the parties and the DJ, and I enjoyed... I had a regular slot. I've got family at home, and I'm staying out till, like, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, or sometimes I'll go out on a Friday and I'll disappear till Sunday. Yeah. You think everything's just going to be all right. It's 10 years' time, we'll just be in the house and everything will be all cushy, but it doesn't. How's she ended up in Norfolk? Um, it was family commitments. I try and see her once a month if I can. I always get told I'm a bad dad. I'm not a bad dad. I can't help it if I haven't got the money to go every weekend. It's not cheap to live, and the wages are not, not how they should be. 
Now Denzel's taking it all on his most audacious plan yet. How you doing, Tom? All right? Been a while, yeah? Stephen? Denzel's mates are the only people I've ever known to break into a prison. You got access to the whole thing then? Yeah, got, they've got access like, literally to the whole building. So, so, apart from in there. Like I say, there's a swimming pool here, there's a football court here. They've recently squatted this site, which is due to be demolished and turned into private housing. Denzel's got big plans for this place. He wants to throw one massive illegal rave, hoping to generate around 40,000 pounds. So yeah, this is a room main room. You fit a lot of people in here as well. Stage. Main stage. That's a bit of you, isn't it? That's a bit of you, <laughs> like I say, I'm a, I'm a small fish in a big pond, but we know a big boy in the big pond. And then we rang him, and he was he was interested in the party. I won't name him, but he was interested right. in the party. Mm -hmm. And um, he said he could get 500 marching strong off the train from London. Like 10 pound a person, and then obviously, depending on how many people come, there's other money to be made through the naughty stuff. To clarify for people who don't know what naughty stuff is? Uh, talk to Frank, which means I eat drugs. Yeah, so um, I don't get my hands involved with that. Normally the police turn up, but they normally kick back as long as there's no action. So now the police can't shut the party down because they ain't got the manpower because of the cutbacks. If you were doing a tenner a ticket, how many people would you reckon you'd fill this size venue with? If, this, if we could do this legally in here, we could get 2,000 to 3,000 in here easy, Tom, couldn't we? I reckon up to 5,000 people. It would be the biggest party in history in a prison. Mm -hmm. Denzel's plans may be illegal, but isn't his go-getting spirit something we used to admire amongst the working class? See you later, lads. See you later. Thank you very much, yeah? He's landed a big opportunity, but has he got the determination to see it through? While Denzel tries to reinvent himself, David's still struggling to understand who he is. To keep him occupied, Steve's taken him to a football match, organised by a charity for unemployed men. I've got to drag him down, if he does really? come down, yeah, cos... Uh, Why do you think he finds it so hard to motivate himself? Just lack of opportunity, really, you know what I mean? I think he'd rather just mill about round it off, still. At his age, he should be out grafting. Yeah. His room in a nearby hostel. I'm shocked by how little control David has over his life. I've just got a letter, so I went to the doctors and I went on the set. Well, I can't read it, we'll be able to read it for me. Yeah, of course. David's dyslexic and has never learned to read or write. Your claim for employment and support allowance. You meet the eligibility criteria for support group. This means you are not required to take part in any work related activity. If you want more information, please get in touch with us. Yeah. That's fine. Because I've been put on, do you know, like, some tablets, do you know, for, like, I've been suffering with bad, like, anxiety mm -hmm. and depression over losing my parents. I've, like, been suffering bad. What are the restrictions living somewhere like this? You've got to sign in and out. But if you're gone for more than two days, they're in the police and report you missing. And do a lot of people go missing? Yeah, loads of people go missing. I'd find it impossible not having Anywhere to put your roots down. I suppose this is the safety net for people who are working class and for who there is no other support. Otherwise, you end up on the streets, which is by far worse. What I want to understand is what's expected of you? How do you turn this around? What are the steps from here to where? How do you get from here, existing on the fringes of society, back towards more central ground? You know, how do you get out of deep waters? How do, you, how do you get back to the shore? If Dave is lost at sea, back in Eastleigh, Lewis is setting course for uncharted territory. How you doing? Hard at work? Indeed, Shock. as always. How you doing? All Good right, there. how are you? Good. All right. How have the exams that you've taken gone? Um, so far, I've taken two exams, and uh, they've been OK. So, yeah, just uh, making sure the next one's go well, really. How nervous are you about this all? 
I mean, I was concerned. He's just recently got a girlfriend. And obviously, as a mummy, yeah, I'm like, oh my God, girlfriend, he's got exams. What are we going to do? But if he messes it up, then it's on his head, be it, isn't it? If you think about education more broadly, I suppose there's also an aspect of it that if, you know, for generations, families haven't seen school as important, that the kids aren't pushed in that direction because of a trade that the family have always worked in. It wasn't in ours, was it? You did your exams, didn't you? Yeah, not very well, though. Not very well, and I didn't do mine at all. But I feel that Lewis has fought his way through against all the odds to do what he wants to do. And it worries me that he'll go, Mum, do you know what? I'm out of here, see you later. Mm -hmm. You were my mum. In preparation for an open day at Cambridge University, Lewis has asked me to help him update his wardrobe. Right. Yeah, when you put that on, what do you see? Oh, success, I think. What do, you, what do you think of these? I don't mind the lace-up, but for me, they're a bit shiny and a bit square. Oh, yeah, that, perhaps that end is a bit, yeah. Is it that Lewis wants to fit in? Or does he want to disguise where he's from? I guess I do have a sort of image of what I want to be, and that correlates with Cambridge and, and success. Mm -hmm. So... But how yeah. does that marry up with coming from a working-class background? Oh. Um, I don't know, people sort of expect you not to be working class when you're wearing that sort of thing. But then does your background become this big secret? Um, well, yeah, but I mean, I, well, I see, thought... Do you worry about it? Like, with, with, you know, if you went, do you worry about going to Cambridge and your background being a limitation, people knowing where you come from and therefore looking at you differently? Everyone values intelligence, mm -hmm. but does everyone... And that's what you want to be judged on, not yeah. your background. But does everyone value... You know, coming up from from humble beginnings. As, as a child, I, I was sort of you know, perhaps intelligent, and I didn't really have a choice in, in the matter of how I was judged because I was so young. Whereas now I have more of a choice. I, I, I don't know if I want to be perceived as being different any, any longer. But um, that's where you've been for a long time. Yeah, yeah. You've been different for a long time. Yeah, I know. But then I'm not sure. Like, will I go there and and be looked down upon as a result of it? I really feel for Lewis, I really do. He does want to leave his working class background behind. Being self-aware is good, but being self-conscious, that's an anxiety, that's an insecurity. It's an insecurity born of class. From not wanting to be judged by a stereotype of the working class to wanting to fit in with, I suppose, a stereotype of, of the middle and upper classes. It's a lot to have to contend with. You know, even for a mind as brilliant as his, to constantly be worrying about standing out or fitting in, it's not easy. The feeling is almost though he's going to somewhere where he doesn't really belong. Thank you. Thank you. For working class lads, the anxiety often isn't failure, but success, and a fear that you'll always be stuck between two worlds. Lewis still needs to get the grades. The need to belong is a powerful drive, and in Bolton, I'm about to see where this desire can lead. Bolton's on its knees. You know, there's a lot of foreign people living in this town now, and it's, it's just like demoralising. You're thinking, wow, you feel like a stranger in yeah, your own... Yeah, you do feel a stranger in your own town. Yeah. There's always been a strong entrepreneurial spirit to the working classes. Sometimes lack of money can lead to genuine creativity. What's that in? But ideas are one thing. What's that in? Yeah, what's going on? Come on, in big party, what's happening? It's all come to an end, mate. Please, high court uh, bailiffs, they just come bowling through the door. Because that was going to make you some money, wasn't it? It was going to make headlines, it was going to make a lot of money. Because people have never been to a jail, so you knew people were going to attend. And it was essentially going to earn 40, 30 to 40 grand. Personally, what would it have done for you? Personally, it would have probably got me, in a, got me in my own flat. I was looking at moving out. Surely it would have made it seeing your door a little bit easier as well. It would have been. Yeah, actually, now you've said that, it would have. Yeah, it would have. So you don't know what you're going to do with the money when you got it until it's in front of you. So you could either spunk it or you could use it wisely, but 
Who knows until you get it. So what's next? Because obviously we've lost this venue for now. I'm going to do something legal. I wonder whether this setback might help Denzel focus on the responsibilities he does have. Basically, we're uh, going to be putting a night on legitimately. I suppose if a squat party, you've got a chance of getting arrested. But what happens if you have a bad turnout? What, a squat party? Nah, here. The, again, pick, what you do, you, like you say, you pick yourself up and learn from your mistakes. If we all work together hard, we should get the numbers easily. A few weeks later, Denzel's asked me to meet him in another seaside town. Denzel. How are you doing? You all right, all right? Yeah, good. Good. What are we doing in Great Yarmouth? Well, this is a new venture. A, a new story to tell one. you. A new story is going to be told. What's going on with the other night that you were doing? Well, funny story. It's been double booked in for... Um, Phil Mitchell's been booked in, hasn't he? He's only come in and took over our event, hasn't he? So he's been double booked in. Phil... So someone called Phil Mitchell or the bloke no, who Phil plays Mitchell Phil Mitchell? Phil Mitchell has been booked in. Phil Mitchell? Phil Mitchell's come rolling in from EastEnders and took us over, really. You know what I mean? You know how big Phil Mitchell is, but that's what we had to put it on hold. Denzel's latest scheme is to form a partnership with Great Yarmouth's entertainment kingpin, Ray. This is another one of Ray's places, Caesar's Palace. How you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, this yeah. is Stephen. How you doing, mate? Yeah, Good right. to meet you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the business proposition? What's he trying to rope you into? He wants to do a, a big pr promotion night. He has a, an act of someone come. Basically, I want to extend my parties to bigger things. I want to start making a business, maybe start making some good return. But Ray is going to back me financially. I'd like to see you put something of your own money in. Of course, yeah. Something. Got, yeah. What do you envision you putting in versus what Denzel puts I want, in? I want to see Denzel put £500 into my 3000 on the first go. And if I do make profit from each party, then yeah. I just put it away into a little pot somewhere and just spend some and keep some. Yeah. Yeah. I'd spend none. It's not going to do you any good. I'd, I'd spend none. Come on, you just said you're 30, you've got to start looking at things differently. Yeah, but you've still got to live a life. Yeah, but you also want to build a business, didn't you? Oh, if you're serious, you've got to yeah, be serious. you've still got to live a life with a business. Yeah, but the living comes after, the work comes first, yeah. man. You've got to yeah, go out. Yeah, It is true, but I still enjoy life. <laughs> I'm worried that Denzel was bought into the Del Boy myth of wheeling and dealing. And can't see what's really behind Ray's success. I must even now still be doing 80, 90 hours, 100% a week, every week of the summer. Why do you think it is that so many white working class men are underachieving? I'll give you an example. I had a friend come to me once and he said to me, if, if you know anyone who's got any work, and I said, well, actually, you can come and help me. I'm car cleaning tomorrow and I've got a lot on. And he said, oh, I'll come car clean when I'm desperate. And being too good for a job when you've got no job, in my eyes, just don't, you know, that don't exist. What about Denzel? If he's thinking he's going to have a little bit of a party at the same time, there's a lot of people in that industry that are like that and they don't succeed. Denzel seems to be putting so much of his energy into all of these different little schemes and scams. There's nothing wrong with having dreams and working towards them. But his situation, living at his nan's, you know, he's comfortable. He's got it easy. And because of that, he has been somewhat infantilised. He's not growing up. He's not... He's not moving out. He's not moving forward. I've been thinking about how roots, family and community play such an important role in the working class character. Sometimes they can hold you back, but more often, they're what keeps you afloat. I grew up with my nan on a council estate in Hackney. That's a nice one. So mum was 16 then? Yes. She left and then I was left in your care. And so then you got custody of me. You know, you've already brought three kids up and all of a sudden you're bringing up me. Well, it was either that or I'd be put into care. So what did you want me to do? Well, I'm quite happy. You was my first grandson. I'm quite happy you didn't You was put... nanny's first great-grandson. Yeah. So here's various pictures of me at school. He's my best friend, Zephyr. You remember Zephyr? Yeah. I was the only white kid in my class, but it, I don't know, it was just, it was the way the area was. Like, Clapton people were from everywhere. Yeah. It wasn't predominantly anything. Everyone was from all over. 
it was good. Like race wasn't really something that was discussed when we were kids. We just were kids. You know, I'd go into certain friends' houses and say yes to food, like okra and things. I would never, you know, you would never have cooked. But it, it opened me up to such a, you know, a wide variety of, of foods, of music, of, of different culture. And I was lucky for that. You know, it wasn't about whether you were white or you were black. We were all working class. Growing up here, no one had cash. That's what we had in common, not our race or religion. My break came age 21, when a record label discovered me rapping in a local nightclub. But what happens if you have nothing and you feel that your sense of community is fair? You know, there's a lot of foreign people living in this town now and it's, it's just like demoralising. You're thinking, wow. Why does that make you feel demoralised? Why does it have because such an effect on you? I was told if we'd have stayed in Europe, you know, the Brexit thing, yeah. there was 60,000 Turkish families coming over here, guaranteed. And when they do come over, they like, guaranteed a roof over their head, new they? tellers. <laughs> they do. Trust guaranteed. me. I've not... I don't, I don't know that to be true. I have slept on these streets. I have not seen one Asian person. I have not seen one black person. <sighs> but, like, going on a peaceful march with Britain first is seen as a bad thing because you're holding an English flag up in an English town. They don't like it. And they call us Nazis. We're not Nazis. We're nothing to do with Germany. Have you ever been on a rally? Yeah, I went in one in London. So I put him first in London. How did you end up there? Because uh, Steve took me. I went with him because he said, uh, do you want to come on this march, put him first? He said, yeah, I'll come with you. What was the atmosphere like? What? It was good because obviously you met loads of new people. It was like a big family. And they were nice people. You could have a conversation with them. Steve doesn't feel like he has anything or is a part of anything. Is it that he has so little, the only thing he feels he actually has is his, his Britishness, his, his whiteness. If you're angry at anyone, be angry at the elite that impose austerity and hurt you even more. Direct your anger down that avenue. Steve and David are planning on going to another Britain First march, but this time I am going along with them. Lewis is helping me understand the self-doubt that comes with success. With his exams finally over, we're in Cambridge for a university open day. And a glimpse at the life that awaits, if he can make the grade. I guess for him it's a window into the world that, that awaits him if his exams go well. Is it going to be enough, do you reckon? You know, the shirts, the blazers being well-spoken, is that going to be enough for him to fit in here? All he has is this idea of who he has to be. Very relaxing. Yeah, it's very calm and quiet. Mm. Mm. If I'm honest, I'm worried that Cambridge isn't for the likes of us. Seb's role is to help working-class students adapt to university life. So how did you grow up? What's your background? Um, so I've, I'm from Southampton. I'm state-educated through and through. My mum, she got made redundant. My dad stitched a job at a similar time. And this was all when I was starting uni. Were there ever any moments where, you know, being working-class has made you feel uncomfortable? I mean, there's been individuals that I've... I've interact with well, what I've bumped with and afterwards I've been like, I'm not going to talk to you again. How many people do you get through these gates that are from disadvantaged backgrounds? The, the statistic that I do know is 35% of the uni are from private schools. The rest are from state funded at least. I would have expected quite a lot more of the students to be from, from public school. I'm surprised about how low the number is. Yeah, I I'm, thought it would be more. Surprised, yeah. You are, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You're like Mr. Nerd, know everything. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. Listen, I definitely had a preconception of what I thought it would be. 
you know, where has that come from? You know, me thinking it'd be snooty and it'd be just, you know, it'd be pompous. I don't, where does that come from? So this is where you're going to be spending most of your time? It's no different for people who would look at me and go, he's, he's common as muck. As much as anything, class is about the barriers that we erect in our own minds. One thing about Cambridge is that you're taught by world leaders in their field. Um, Stephen Hawking, he's been in and around the department this week. You don't have to be anxious about coming here as someone who is from a working class background. That's not going to hold you back. The only thing that will hinder you here is not being as good as the next man. And that's fair. Lewis was worried that being working class would hold him back. But if he can make it here, perhaps university will help him leave his class hang-ups behind. He's so close to it now, and you can see the excitement in him. It will be such a huge stumbling block for him if he doesn't get those results, because this is where he wants to be. This is how he will fulfill himself entirely. I was beginning to wonder whether Denzel would ever get his big break. But I've heard he's come into some money. I just hope he's using it wisely. How did you get the money for the bike then? Uh, uh, insurance claim. What happened? Someone hit me up the arse of my car. So you had whiplash? Yeah. Was it really bad? <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. plays up now. I'm still sore now. Yeah. How much did it cost? Uh, that one's just over two grand. So it weren't a bad little buy. I'm no one to tell Denzel what he should spend his money on. But it does make you question his priorities. You can't help but not. It's more of an excitement just riding one of these around, you know what I mean? You don't see them every day. But then, does part of you feel like that two grand could have been better spent elsewhere? Uh, yeah, but the opportunity was there to grab this. I suppose the other thing as well, you know, you were saying it, it costs a lot to get to and from seeing your daughter and that as well. Yeah, but if I didn't get this, I would have just spent that money anyway. I would have just wasted that money. I would have seen my daughter a few times from it, but it would have just got wasted on willy-nilly stuff. Denzel talks a lot about a lack of opportunity and finances and things that you can tie in with being working class. And those things up to a point are reasons for not being able to move forward and not being able to do certain things. But at a point, I think they become excuses. You know, like at the point where you do the wrong thing with those opportunities and that's when it doesn't come down to class, it comes down to your decisions. In the wake of the Rochdale sex abuse scandal, Britain First have organised a protest. It seems to me that the anger here isn't just about the white girls whose abuse was ignored. It's a cry of rage from a whole class of people who feel abandoned and don't really know who they are anymore. No surrender! No surrender! No surrender to the Pakistan! He is marching, but given some of the racism on display, I'm relieved to see David has decided not to come. Do you not worry that, you know, some of this incites hatred? I don't see how anybody can perceive today as inciting hatred. I mean, look around you. The people here today are purely here because we love our country, and the people in our country include the children that have been systematically targeted by come Pakistani away from that for, Come away from that for a minute. But that's why we're here. Yeah, no, for the, this march, but I'm talking about overall, what's, what are the British values that you want to see restored or that you don't feel are present today? It makes sense for us to say, don't build a mosque on every corner of our Christian country. You can see your cameraman sighing at every opportunity. I'm not going to peddle a false narrative. I'm here I don't want a false because narrative. I want these Pakistani Muslims to get their filthy hands off of our kids. Yeah. That's yeah. You tell the 
So all Pakistanis have no, filthy hands. Of course not every Pakistani. See, look, how, no, that's how what I'm you, asking the question. How do you take what I just said and spin it that way? Because you used the, the phrase was these fil their filthy hands. There. Yes, because they not... raped these kids. Okay, then yeah, fair enough. Then the rapists, the rapists. Okay. Kids being raped. But the mainstream parties aren't. I've got kids happy. being raped. Yeah. Well, I don't have children. Oh, what are you defending it for? Oh, I would never defend the rapist. Yeah, obviously, obviously tensions are high. Because I would never def I would never defend the rapist. How could you? What am I doing here? I'm doing a documentary. I'm doing a documentary on white working class. White working class, that's a bit rude. Yeah. Yeah. for all yeah. my drugs. No, it's not. I haven't come here to call names, so don't tell me what I am. When you're amongst that crowd, what do you feel? Um, a sense of purpose and a sense of, you know, this is our country, let's be proud of it. You know, there's generations gone by and they've died for that flag. You've got to be proud of your country. country has not been very kind to you, and that's not the fault of, of anyone, Muslim or foreign. It is. It's much more a class problem. It's, yeah. not, it's not a race problem. Because the, the tension from unemployment, and if they had a, a purpose and a job to go to, I think in towns like Bolton and North West Towns, there won't be as much tension. What do you want the streets to look like? Investment in towns that need investing. Fiver in bustling, bring the mills back. I wonder whether what Steve really wants back isn't so much his streets or even his country, but rather a feeling of pride and self-worth. I'm beginning to think that the idea, you know, even the phrase working class values, from what I can see, it's, it's a certain set of insecurities, really. It's a lack of self-worth, it's a lack of ownership. It's instability, it's, it's uncertainty. And, uh, it's, it's being stuck. Out of everyone I've met, David has seemed the most adrift. Six weeks after the march, I finally caught up with him. How you doing? Oh, no, just working. Yeah? Just finished. That's a change. Yeah. What are you doing? Uh, roofing. I've been doing it for about three weeks. Yeah? It's good. I fell through the roof again today, though. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> yeah. You enjoying it, though? Yeah, I'm enjoying it, cos I know I'm doing something good for myself. Instead of being on benefits, I've come off it. Mm -hmm. And I've gone and got a proper job. How many of the people, you know, that you used to knock about with, do you still see? None. I can't be asked with them. I just want to do my own thing now. What about your mate Steve? So you're not Nothing. in touch? No. Everyone's the same. You still bleed the same blood, so you're still the same people. It don't, mind about, it don't matter about the colour of the skin. you still got hearts. What's your living situation, is that? I live with my bird. Yeah? And that's a picture of her. I've got a girlfriend who I can come back to. I know she's not just going to run off. She's there. She's loving, she's caring. So she's good for me. Yeah, she looks sweet, man. You look good together. She is. She's cute and straight now. She's got to be cute to be with me. Oh, all right, here you go. <laughs> Bertie big bollocks. I'm just going to keep going. Just keep working. So I don't want to fuck it up. He didn't know who he was before. He knew what he'd been through and he knew how much that had hurt and he knew how down he felt. He was aware of his feelings. He knew how fucking crap he felt. Who was he then? He was Dave, the guy that was stuck in a hostel who had lost both of his parents and was depressed and was on the sick because of his anxiety because he couldn't sleep. Who is he now? Oh, Dave, what, Dave, the, the roofer? The broker goes out with Chloe. It's amazing what employment and purpose can do for a man. Someone who has always had direction is Lewis. It's August and the results of his Cambridge entrance exams are about to be released. It is nearly half 11 at night and tonight is the night. At midnight, one minute past, we find out if he's getting into Trinity. With his A-levels already in the bag, Lewis's whole future now rests on passing these entrance exams. I'm nervous, so I can't imagine how Lewis is feeling right now. I hope 
I really bloody hope, man. I'm really rooting for him. You're rooting for him as well, aren't you? How are you? I'm very, very, very nervous. <laughs> to say very. The least. <laughs> What's going through your mind at the moment? Um, plenty of things. Um, that I've blown it. That I'm not going to make it. We've been trying to pacify you, haven't we? Yes. Trying to say the right thing. I feel like sick. We're one minute two, by the way. Um, oh. I just wait, hate a second. Just like he needs to compose himself. Yeah. Come on, you can't change it. You have to do it. Do you want a hug? You're gonna be alright, mate. Well, no. Lewis, I'll do it if you want me to. No, no, I because we want Just to Just do it. Go on. I think pass the passion bit. Everyone, down, everyone would lock go. in. Let's go now. One, one, one. <laughs> one, one, one. Ah! Fucking run. Come on, she's already funny. Ah! <laughs> sorry. Are you sorry for what? <laughs> well oh, done, dear. bro. I'm proud of you, child. I can't believe it. I guess Joe can take nothing but pride in, in what's just happened. Yeah, he's going to leave the house, and yeah, he's moving on, but... You know, he's he's doing what he's doing because of his beginnings in life, and despite how humble they were, uh, he's he's going to be afforded many more opportunities than than most of the people that have, have grown up where he has. In the next film, I meet three more very different working class lads. It's not fair to my family. I'm going to end up getting myself really fucking out. And I explore how the choices men make impact on their families. What's your sexuality? You have a question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is really at stake this time if he comes out and he messes around? Then that's it. There's no point in upsetting him anymore. There's quite a distinct knack of white working class, though. I just don't know that white boys have got, you know, the confidence. Yeah.